Good morning, class, sir. I'm Lieutenant Lemon. I'm going to be giving an unclassified brief on the analysis of mission command principles with Captain Meyer in the Battle of Wanaha in Afghanistan in 2008. And we're going to use this to uh, learn from his role in the Battle of Wanaha and how he commanded, and then figure out how we're going to apply those. So, just to give a little bit of um, background first, and then we'll go into the mission command principles. I picked four mutual trust, uh, discipline initiative commanders intent and uh, prudent risk, and he did those at various levels. These are all, all good things that Captain Meyer did. Uh, and then we'll finally close out with the outcome of the battle and the significance to us in the class. Those are my references. So general area of operation, this goes to what Lieutenant Johnson briefed. Um, both of these commanders um, were battle buddies. Um, Captain Kearney was in battle company, and Captain Meyer was chosen company. Uh, both of uh, uh, 2503 infantry battalion, 173rd um, brigade combat team uh, working out of RCPs. So initially, they um, this company, chosen company, was part of working out of Wagal Valley, and they had one platoon at Cops within the valley, and then they had one platoon at Camp Blessing, which is where the town headquarters was at for QRF, and then they rotated periodically through um, the valley. And they were at Cop Bella. And so Cop Bella was farther away from Camp Blessing to the south. Uh, it also could only be uh, resupplied through air lift um, and had uh, issues with the local populace. They felt like it was needed to move to a knot where the local population government was at. Um, and it was closer to Camp Blessing, about half the distance, five miles. Um, and was able to receive uh, resupply through ground forces. So that's that's the reason why they needed to move to Renat, which was the preface for the Battle of Renat. Just before the the company moved the platoon from uh, Katbala to Renat, they had a attack in uh, at Camp, or Katbala, and during this attack. Uh, which was mortar rounds uh, into the cop. They actually, Captain Meyer uh, called um, fire um, and struck two vehicles that the insurgents were using um, for uh, to leave the area that they were shooting these indirect fires at them. Um, and it actually killed some civilians in the process. And so there's tension between the local populace and with the American forces. And we'll talk about that a little bit more next. But that just gives you a, a background of what's going on. This is what the task force looks like for their move to whatnot. This is what the cop and whatnot, cop collar, was going to look like. Um, this is also what's going to talk, we're going to talk about mutual trust. So within mutual trust, building a cohesive team, you have to do this over time, and you use this do this through shared experience, and this unit had it. They're at the end of their 15 month tour, this, they have 13 days left before they're about to leave. All their personal belongings were gone already, and they just had you know, the rucksack and their weapon basically left. And so they had engaged the enemy 48 times over those 15 months in the Wagal Valley, so they knew the population, they knew the terrain, uh, and they knew how to work together to defeat the enemy. So they already had that. Captain Meyer had a was well guarded within the the battalion, and he had a reputation of being calm and contemplative um, in his leadership style. And the platoon sergeant even said this unit was tight knit, um, and they were highly efficient in their their skills. You can see that this mutual trust extended from all the way up to all the way down to the lowest soldier. Um, as having two companies and or two platoons, excuse me, in different locations. Captain Meyer can be at both places at once, so he had to instill trust into the subordinate commanders to subordinate leaders to call for fire when needed if he wasn't there um, and make hard decisions about engaging the enemy because he wasn't always going to be present where they were at. Um, also, during the Battle of Wanat, there were seamless transitions um, as personnel were moving across the the OP uh, or from the cop to the OP, the observation point, about 100 meters away. Every time someone came in, um, that if they were senior, they were taking charge, and people were allowing them to do that. And when there was absence of an NCO, those soldiers were stepping up and becoming NCOs, acting like NCOs, 
Um, so there was this, this mutual trust all the way down to the lowest level, like, we can do this. However, mutual trust with partners was not established. Not necessarily that we can pinpoint that to Captain Meyer or any fault of his own, but there were issues. So the July 4th attack um, by accidentally killing civilians with the insurgents, that created a, a rift between the local populace and, and the U.S. forces. Additionally, several months before, um, about nine months before, there was an Afghan security guard personnel who accidentally shot and killed uh, one of the platoon sergeants. That also created animosity between U.S. soldiers and any coalition partners that they were working that with, um, to include the ANA, which are included in the task force, the 24 ANA personnel, Afghan National Army personnel. Um, and that created a rift, a, a sense of uh, distrust with those personnel. You can also see this um, with the Shuras, the community meetings leading up to Winnock as they were planning on where they're going to put the, the cop and stuff like that. There was lots of tension between the local government and population and the U.S. forces. Um, stuff like they didn't eat lunch, which is a cultural norm. Those are like little red or yellow flags um, saying like, hey, there's, some, there's an issue here between the local population. Uh, and that proved to be a, a big factor in the battle as those pro population personnel allowed those insurgents to come in uh, and, and group up in Winnock. In fact, the day before the battle, uh, Lieutenant Brostrom, the, the, platoon, sorry, or the platoon leader who was there at the cop, um, was actually not invited to one of these council meetings, which is not okay, but that is totally unheard of. They are always um, invited and presented um, with information for them, what's going on in the community. Um, as I said, he did a really good job of building mutual trust within the company, and the more you build mutual trust, the more you are going to um, give your subordinates the right to ex uh, exercise discipline So you could see that um, as the subordinates were able to call for fire, like I said earlier, um, actually when they were setting up the cop, um, and they were putting an OP in, one of the specialists said, hey, I think we should do this. And they were saying, yeah, you know what, you're right. So they're taking E4s guidance um, and so they're saying hey I trust that you have the initiative to do this and we're going to take your advice um, and so that shows just how much discipline and initiative was in there however Captain Myers almost too much leaned on this so he wasn't part of the detailed planning for the cop layout and he actually wasn't even there like he was supposed to be originally for the initial setup he arrived three days later um, and that's because he wanted to be at Camp Blessing to be interviewed um, for the investigation for the July 4th attack at Bella. Um, and this is actually something that in the investigation afterwards, um, they said Captain Meyer was derelict in his duties because he neglected to be detailed, uh, detailing the thought process to set up this cop. Um, and they said that his, his late arrival to the cop also um, greatly hindered their ability to, to recover from any lack of sustainment or support. Um, so these are big deals. Um, and because he exercised um, initiative, they have very little guidance to go off of, um, which is where you see a lack of clear commander's intent. So yes, he gave some guidance, but there was no mission orders. And then he wasn't there physically able to guide that platoon leader in, in his intent. And when he did arrive, he said, hey, this doesn't meet my intent, and we need to fix it. But at that point, it was too late. When they were going to fix the, when they were going to fix the uh, OP, um, it was, that was the day that they got um, attacked. And, I mean, he has to take some prudent risk. I mean, he's a commander. He can't be, like I said, he can't be at both places at once. Um, but his choice to, to stay behind and not be there to help um, really was, um, was risky. And when we talk about prudent risk, there's a difference between accepting prudent risk and gambling. And ADRP 6 F 0 talks about gamble being um, staking the success of an entire action on a single about event without considering the hazard to the force to the event not unfold as envisioned. And by related, uh, relying on past enemy experiences where the enemy wasn't going to come together and assault in such a great force as they did here with 150 um, insurgents, he almost gambled 
um, by saying, hey, they're going to hit us in 90 days, not in three days. Um, and this led to um, to kind of a sense of security with knowing how the community is going to work. So this is where cop collars, and there, there was insurgents attacked all the way, all around, 360 degrees, they were having um, fighting. And so, really, the outcome of this was nine American lives were lost, 27 were wounded, and within three days of the battle, they completely withdrew from the Weigall Valley. Um, and in conclusion, I think his, his lack of oversight, not a clear commander's intent, his reliance on mutual trust and discipline initiative, over-reliance on those things, uh, were factors in the outcome of this battle. Um, and I think that we can't overemphasize one thing and underemphasize another. You're constantly going to have to balance that, and our high point is 2020, but that's something to, to be in perspective. Anyone have any questions? So, what would that be? Yeah, Kate.